Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan Energy Man. Stan Osterman here on Think Tech Hawaii um, to talk about my favorite subject, hydrogen. And if you haven't been watching the show before, you probably don't realize that about 80% of my shows are on hydrogen. And uh, a friend of mine actually had a, a uh, publishes a um, industrial publication on hydrogen. And in there, he has a quote from Jules Verne who claims that water made, making hydrogen will be the fuel of the future. And that's from Jules Verne from, you know, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea history. And this is this is turn of the century writing from last century. So, you know, this is no surprise that hydrogen is, is such a great um, candidate for the fuel that we should be using instead of fossil fuel. But one of the problems that we have with fossil fuels nowadays, especially in the transportation sector, as we try and get hydrogen adopted in electric vehicles, is something we call the chicken and the egg. It seems like if you don't have the cars, nobody wants to build a hydrogen infrastructure. And if you don't have the infrastructure, nobody wants to bring the cars. So getting past the chicken and the egg um, conundrum is always a big topic of discussion in hydrogen transportation. Well, a good friend of ours, and he's been on the show several times, Chris McQuinney, he has a little different slant on how we break that cycle of chicken and egg. And he put together a really great presentation. So I asked him to come on the show today. And he's coming to us from Dayton, Ohio. And he's going to give us a presentation on how we actually start growing um, hydrogen transportation infrastructure to fuel hydrogen fuel cell vehicles like the Toyota Mirai, the Honda Clarity, the two Hyundai hydrogen fuel cell cars, and a whole slew of others that will be coming online in the not too distant future. So Chris, welcome to the show. And uh, thanks for agreeing to do this presentation. Uh, I, I think it really came out really well. Well, thank you, Stan. Appreciate the t opportunity to show people uh, maybe a different pathway to try to build hydrogen infrastructure. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here, give a presentation here to help people understand this. What we want to talk about, like Stan said, is the chicken or the egg. Uh, Millennium Marine Energy is the name of our company. and we believe we're a hydrogen and energy technology company for the new millennium here that we're in. Let me introduce you to the chicken. The chicken is the fuel cell car. And that's because chickens move around and so do the cars. The egg is the station. Stations are usually in a stationary position. And so that makes sense that they'd be the egg because the egg always is sitting still. So what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Well, in the hydrogen space, the age old challenge has been, do you manufacture and sell hydrogen cars only to have your customers not have any place to fuel? Or do you build and install hydrogen infrastructure only to have customers with uh, cars, uh, to sell, no cars to sell hydrogen to? So, um, you know, it's, it's really a big conundrum that's plagued the industry for a while. And the current pathway that's being utilized and executed in the industry is expensive and it relies on government subsidies to make it work. For instance, the California model. Um, the state put up $200 million in a fund and they can fund up to, in some cases, 80% of the station cost with that. So to win the awards from the pool of funds, stations must serve um, uh, over 100 cars a day to be uh, qualified to get in, and then they have to, um, uh, you know, use a pre-chilled hydrogen station, it needs to be J2601, has to have fast fill, has to have communications with the cars, and all these things make the stations expensive. Multiple organizations compete for the state funding and, and, the, and, and install the stations, and several auto manufacturers sell fuel cell cars. And Toyota who's really taken the lead, um, they've, they've you know, been building and selling cars and, and they've also put millions of dollars up for infrastructure to help in that uh, effort. And you know, the stations cost up from three to $4 million depending on how much they dispense today, but the average station to qualify has to be up to 100 to 200 cars a day that it has to be able to handle. And they're usually only, 10 or so cars in an area when they open a new station. So um, in a new area, 
you know, there isn't a lot of cars to buy all of the fuel that they can produce and sell. So without subsidies, it's clear to me that this model will eventually fail because there are not enough cars uh, to sell all the hydrogen to. And in eight years, only 50 stations have been deployed and or a little bit more now, maybe. And there's uh, 8,000 fuel cell cars in California, maybe a little more, 11,000 altogether uh, in, in the world. So California is definitely leading the way and the government model is definitely helpful. And we're all thankful that they've done that because we've learned so much. But because station providers are getting a subsidies uh, and thereby they're just making their money on installing the stations, they've really had no, had no incentive to make the stations in a way that could create a business model that could self-perpetuate. And so the question is, how long will the subsidies last to keep this going? And so recent developments have occurred that has created a paradigm shift uh, needed to solve the chicken and the egg question. Uh, in MRE's case, we've patented, trademarked, and received certificates of attestation from third-party internationally recognized testing laboratories on 16 products that will build the hydrogen fueling infrastructure in a manner that will dramatically uh, make a change in putting, this putting these uh, stations out. And we're going to be dynamically matching the supply uh, with the H2 demand. And that is from our scalable hydrogen fueling appliance. It provides scalability to start small, inexpensive, at 120th the cost of the California model stations, and grow each station to the next factory produced level with three consecutive sizes to scale up to. And then a final level of utility scale hydrogen production from renewables to be uh, distributing gas into the network of stations that you build from big wind farms and solar farms that are producing hydrogen and your truck and hydrogen into the network of stations that you've set up then. And the last really key issue is the first commercially available fuel cell cars have now become then returned to dealers at the end of their lease period or purchase period. And a lot of these cars from different companies can be purchased and shipped into locations outside of California because they've been through their first um, you know, they've gotten the carbon credits and all that stuff off of them. And there's such good uh, cost savings on the new vehicles with the free gas card and all of the state and federal tax credits that people are buying the new cars and the used cars are kind of getting stranded at the station. So um, this gives an opportunity for uh, the station and the cars to be sold together. So the best pathway that we found is to have the chicken and the egg in the same nest. And, you know, what happens when the chicken lays on the egg, it eventually hatches. The key is you need to hatch a rooster. And we think that any company that does both is like a rooster because now they can control and grow more uh, chickens and eggs. And so um, that is what we're trying to do uh, at MRE. And um, Building infrastructure to dynamically match the demand is really the key. Um, the, the same company can control the demand by controlling the car sales and developing a membership structure to allow only those members to access the station. So if you look at a side-to-side -side approach um, between the current model, and let's say it's one of the bigger stations at 500 kilograms a day, and it's a $4 million station, it's pre-chilled, has communications with the car, does 10,000 PSI fueling, and they're centrally located to maybe 10 or 20 cars in an area, and they need 1,000 cars to be profitable. And usually they cite these, so it's like within a five-mile radius to where the majority of the cars are. And in big cities like LA, it could take an hour to get to a station if you're on the outside of that five-mile radius. And, um, you know, how long is it going to take to get 142 cars a day filling there uh, to make the station pay off? And then usually there's one or two nozzles uh, filling the cars. So when it does take off, it ends up being long lines. And so the part about, you know, being able to have a five minute fill kind of goes away when you're 10th in line and it's 
each one of them is doing a five minute fill, well, that's 50 minutes all of a sudden that you're sitting there waiting for gas. So the MRE approach is to put out a station that would be one eighth of the size and would do like 64 kilograms a day. And then um, by putting eight stations in the same area and adding those in as the market grows, instead of putting the whole thing in once before there's enough cars to actually buy it, theoretically, you can grow the uh, demand, you can grow the station's supply with the demand and end up with people being only 7.5 minutes from a station and you have eight nozzles in an area. And because the stations are cheaper, you can sell the fuel for less uh, and, and provide better savings to people. And, um, you know, the eight nozzles makes for shorter lines. So we think when you look at these two things side by side, um, MRE's approach and the products that we have to make that approach possible um, are a real uh, game changer. So um, the markets for our products right now is number one in transportation with fuel cell cars and trucks, and then number two, retail material handling, and number three for storing renewable energy on a large scale because we also have megawatt scale um, products. So what MRE is going to do is build the U.S. transcontinental hydrogen highway infrastructure with 27 stations coast to coast from L.A. to New York. And we'll be trying to locate these at big box stores and car dealerships and fuel and gas stations. So um, the blue line in this map represents the route that we intend to take from L.A. to New York City. And uh, we've already put out uh, two of those stations. And in the state of Ohio, Millennium Rain Energy already has a triangular highway um, that goes 135 miles from Dayton down to Portsmouth, Ohio. From Portsmouth, 95 miles up to um, up to uh, Columbus, Ohio, and then back over to Dayton, Ohio. So you can drive all the way around uh, in that area on hydrogen already with these systems. And we're doing that. So the scalable hydrogen fueling appliance gives MRE a better pathway to consumer adoption, we believe. And we've established ourselves um, as a leading hydrogen infrastructure company by making hydrogen cost effective for consumers. We start out with our locator station. Um, and this is what helps us be able to dynamically match the supply and demand. The locator station just does four kilograms a day. And the stations will have about 32 kilograms of storage altogether collectively. And they'll, um, it's all a self-contained unit. Um, and in, in, in large quantities of more than 25 stations at a time, we can get this station down to a cost of $110,000. So, um, and then add the storage to it. And then once that station becomes overrun with, you know, the, the, the demand is higher than the supply, then we can bring in our 12 kilogram a day station. Um, and all of these products, uh, these two products right here already have um, the certificate of attestation from CSA group meeting all the codes and standards necessary to fuel these cars safely. Um, and then we'll have our uh, 64 kilogram a day product come in after that. So as you can see, we have three phases. And at this level, at 10 cents a kilowatt hour for the input cost for the electricity to make hydrogen from water, like we do with our patented electrolyzers, we have um, $3.89 a gallon of gas equivalent. In California, that's cheaper than gasoline. And in Hawaii, it's cheaper. And in Europe, it's cheaper. So there's a lot of places that this will work and not have to just only be selling the aspect of it being green, but you're also able to be cast of gasoline and give people an economic reason to make the switch. Hey, Chris, could you comment a little bit about how important that certificate of attestation is in terms of citing these stations and being able to move them uh, and getting permits and things like that. Yeah, well, our theory was when we've started our three and a half year uh, venture to get these things, get the certificates of attestation, um, uh, and we spent over a million and a half dollars during that time to do it, um, was that 
if we can get the product derated because we make it so safe and, and employ many different things that we can get it derated to an appliance level. And we were successfully able to do that. And then that gives you a five foot setback limit. So it helps you be able to get, you know, not have to have as much real estate to put out a station because they're so small to begin with. And then you can be five feet from something else. Then also um, by being an appliance um, in two states so far, we found that they accepted that and they, uh, you don't have to have a permit. Uh, you have to have a permit to put in your concrete pad, your electricity, your water, that kind of thing. But that's something that's done on a regular basis and is simple to get. But and then you put the hydrogen station in and um, it, it's it, it treated as an appliance. So, for instance, here in Lafayette, uh, this is an example along the hydrogen highway and picking Denver, Colorado is one of the cities that will be opening up in hydrogen. Um, up at the top of the screen up here, you see that we've got the um, hydrogen station, um, which is the four kilogram a day with uh, 32 kilograms of storage. And we can handle four cars a week with this station. Um, so the car, with the cars start coming in and we've kind of got an idea before we go in there, who wants cars? And so the cars start coming in and when, they, when we get four cars coming out of there and we know we have a fifth one coming in, then it's time to move that station since it's already been paid for. There's no more capital cost to open up a whole new territory and find another hotspot for demand. And then we bring in the 12 kilogram a day station. And then down here between Idaho Springs and Evergreen, we thought that was going to be a good site, but it didn't take hold. So rather than waste all that money, just in one day, we can pick that up and move it to a new site, and then we can we can just we, we just won't put anything else there. Meanwhile, down around Aspen Park, we've got this one and it's taken off, and people are just bringing it, buying more cars and filling up at that station. They're happy, and it keeps on growing. They keep telling their friends, and the station gets to seven cars and. We find out we're going to get an eight and nine and a 10. And it's like, OK, let's move that station, open up a new area and bring in our 64 kilogram a day system. Now, in this case, all the stations before have been 5000 PSI. So the people are only getting a half a fill. They're going half the distance. This station now is our 10,000 PSI fill. So they can go get the full fill and do the full distance that the manufacturer uh, you know, says that they can get in the, in the vehicle, which is about 300 to 350 miles average. So anyways, now these other stations that you've got located in new places, they can continue and start to look, get cars at them. So this is kind of a way to time elapse uh, and see how our products work in um, developing infrastructure, starting small and growing big. Um, so then once you get a station network set up, that's where our mega harvester comes in. And we can build a system that the, uh, the 3D system that you're looking at there is actually the same stacks that you saw a real picture on the page before of our, um, our, our, our system that is our 64 kilogram a day electrolyzer. So those are already in production. Um, and we're, 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 they work great. And you hook these up to a megawatt scale wind farm or solar farm or both. And now you can produce hydrogen much cheaper because the cost of renewable energy at utility scale can be as low as two cents a kilowatt hour. And with that, you can drive the hydrogen cost way down. And then you truck that hydrogen in to the existing um, systems. And the other thing that opens up then when you do that is now you can store utility scale renewable energy in the form of hydrogen. And our numbers show that this could be as much as 73% less cost than using battery. According to a Department of Energy study published in 2017 that shows lithium ion battery storage costs in as do you have to get to 60 megawatts to get this level? But $380 per kilowatt hour. So 
with MRE's mega harvester products and our super tanker storage vessels that we're building, we can get down to $99 a kilowatt hour for storage. And um, so this is a really big deal. We believe it's going to revolutionize the energy storage methods um, when, you know, and the world's already found out about this in some areas. And there's right now over 60 gigawatts worth of hydrogen production from electrolysis in demand and deals in the works in 32 different countries around the world. So it's incredible what's happening. And MRE is going to play in that game as well. Hey, Chris, so, you know, you, you bring up an important point here, and I know you try and you focus on transportation, but and that um, comparison between batteries and hydrogen for massive energy storage, doesn't that mean there's a place for hydrogen on the grid as well? Absolutely. So um, you, you, you you use a fuel cell and you put that energy back on the grid, or you can use that like we're going to use it uh, and, and, and put it into transportation. So hydrogen makes it a way for you to diversify the electrons that can't be done with just battery storage only. Great. So... Um, we have a growing and robust IP portfolio. We have nine patents and one pending. Uh, we have four in the United States, three in the European Union, and two in Canada, uh, and one more pending in the U.S. We have three trademarks on the auto art name, the H2 with the leaf and the green banner around our stations. And we have two certificates of attestation from CSA. And again, this is what I said earlier, where it's important to have the shorter setback limits and to call it an appliance. Um, and this is our factory that we produce our products in, in Dayton, Ohio. This was an old Cadillac dealership. So it's got a beautiful marble showroom with spotlights in it and fancy furniture and all that kind of stuff in the showroom where you see the glass in the front. And it's got a second floor and a third floor, and you can drive vehicles on all three floors. So we've got about 40,000 square foot of space, and we're debt-free except for what the company owes me. And um it's a really exciting opportunity that we have, and uh, we've got a great team of people, and we're getting ready to expand and do some pretty magnificent things. So um, thank you for your time, and we really appreciate the opportunity to show, it, show this to you. You can find out more about our company at www.mreh2.com. So Chris, thanks, thanks a lot. I mean, that presentation when I saw it the other day, just really, it says it all, and and it explains it in such a clear way for people who really um, don't understand the chicken and egg conundrum. Um, you know, it gives them a real clear picture of how to go forward and develop hydrogen infrastructure in a reasonable, um, self-sustaining, and even redundant. You know, you're, you're, when you commented that now you have like eight nozzles instead of just one at that one station and how many cars you can refuel. That also means that if that one station went down and you only had the one station, only macro, you're, you you can't do anything with all those hundred, hundreds of cars. You have eight nozzles and two of them go down. You still have six nozzles left to be fueling, you know, all the other cars and they're only a couple miles apart, you know, instead of, you know, being one within a five miles uh, radius. <clears throat> the the flexibility, the the redundancy the it just it just makes so much sense so I, I really appreciate you a putting that presentation together and, and b bringing it to us today because i i think it explains a lot yeah it really does it's been one of my biggest struggles for since i've, I've been doing this since 2003 and i've been part of the codes and standards committees since uh 2014 and um, one of the biggest things that everybody has problems dealing with is how to solve the chicken and egg. But in my case, it's been really difficult to explain to people why our way of doing hydrogen infrastructure is an alternative that deserves the attention of the people to make it happen. And um, so I think this is... I've been struggling with it for a while and how to explain it. I've been playing around with this presentation now for about six to eight weeks. And I've given it four times now since I finished it a week ago and first showed it to you. And, um, it, and, it, and it, people are really getting it instantly. You can give this to somebody who knows nothing about hydrogen and are like, oh, I see what you're doing. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, instead of struggling with all of the details, you know. 
and they even kind of laugh a little bit about the chicken and the egg and having roosters, you know. It, so it, it makes it memorable, and yeah. and that's part of the whole thing is you know we've all recognized all of us that the education piece is critical for us with hydrogen. There are so many um, so much misinformation based on Hindenburg and H bombs and everything that people don't understand that hydrogen is actually really safe, um, well understood, and has been used by NASA for decades and decades to go into space. Um, and even the U.S. Navy uses hydrogen on their uh, hydrogen electrolyzers on their sub to make oxygen, and they're throwing the hydrogen away. And yeah. to get that equipment certified on a nuclear submarine is no small small feat. Mm -hmm. And but it's on there, and that means it's been tested, explosion proof, all kinds of uh, testing has been done to make sure that that's good, safe um, technology to to put on a ship where you know people's lives are at risk if if anything happened to a submarine, you know, a couple miles under the ocean. Uh, you just can't put any old equipment on there. It really has to be put through the ringer to make sure it's safe. And hydrogen's met all those things. So well, it's not only safe to stand, that. but it's dependable. Their life depends on it because they're breathing the oxygen. Exactly. So it, it's, it's their life support system. So that, that just gives people the idea of how, how dependable the systems are. And, um, and so what we've really done is we've driven the cost down because of some of the way our stuff works and the way it's patented and our electrolyzers are just really super cost effective and rugged and durable. And so, um, yeah, it's a, it, and, and, and the safety, you know, we have had no incidents and we've been having stations out in the field since 2010. I know I have serial number two of your two, two kilogram a day stations. And it just like you say, it's pretty much bulletproof. It's yeah. easy to maintain and it's reliable. And mm -hmm. the Navy and the Army have both looked at my station that I had at Hickam and on Cook Street in Honolulu. And that's what sold them to get stations from you also and start right. moving in the hydrogen direction. That's right. And it, it's uh, really fun to watch the Department of Defense get excited about hydrogen the way we are. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so I really appreciate they're, that. They're, they're such great people and they've got great ideas and it's been really a, a pleasure working with them as well. All right. Well, Chris, thanks again for the presentation today, and, and I really appreciate you coming on and staying up a little late from uh, after dinner over there in Dayton to to be with us. And I uh, hope you get to come over to Hawaii uh, pretty soon and yeah. spend some actual FaceTime with us and on the Big Island with Paul and Mitch. Yeah. And uh, we we appreciate your time today. And thank you again. Thank you for the opportunity. Sure. So that'll wrap us up for Stan the Energy Man today uh, on Think Tech Hawaii. And I hope you'll check out the other shows on Think Tech. And if you can, uh, maybe donate a little bit of money to Think Tech uh, for keeping us our shows on the air. We really appreciate it. Until next week, Tuesday, this is Stan Osterman, Stan the Energy Man, signing off. Aloha. <laughs>